Hey everyone, this is Kevin from thechesswebsite.com and today we're in round four of our coverage. The 2018 Tata Steel Tournaments. Our competitors today, White's going to be played by Vladimir Kramnik. He's had three games and he's had a win, loss, and a draw. So the, the trifecta and his opponent, Peter Svidler, playing the black pieces, has three draws. So they are tied with one and a half points going into round four, both in striking distance. If either of these players can win, they would only be half a point behind the leader. So looking to get off to a strong start with a 12 round tournament here in round number four. So we'll get started with White. Uh, Vladimir plays knight to f3, followed by knight to f6. I thought for sure we were going to see the Petrov defense just because we've been seeing that all tournament long, it seems like. But instead, uh, we see pawn to g3, pawn to d5. So it looks like Black is playing a Grunfeld defense. Bishop here to g2. Castle on the king side, and then we do morph into the Grunfield opening, uh, which is somewhat interesting because we normally don't see a Fianchetto on the king side in the Grunfield, but that's exactly what we see. Both sides are Fianchetto to the king side of the board. They have castled, uh, and now we have pawn over here to c4. So the queen's gambit uh, decline type of lines. Now there's a couple options uh, that Black has here. He could play pawn to c6, not take this pawn. Could also decide to, to take this pawn and then going to be met with knight to a3, attacking the pawn. Usually just going to give this pawn back if he did want to hold on to it. Bishop to e6 makes some sense. It does block off this pawn from pushing forward. Uh, now White could play, say, g5, attacking the bishop. Bishop could come here to d5, pawn to e4, White putting a lot of pressure, forcing his opponent to move his bishop all over the place. Pawn to h6, forcing the knight to move. But let's go ahead and capture some material here. Pawn takes on d5. Pawn recaptures. Knight takes here on c4. Knight takes, and then bishop takes that pawn here on g5. Uh, all in all, this is going to be very, very good for for white. He has center control here. Uh, black was not able to hold on to that material like he had hoped for. Um, so this is one option uh, that black could go down. Both sides might not play exactly like this if we do see an exchange here on c4. Uh, but after five minutes, uh, Peter decided to play the move pawn to c6, which was his other option up until this point. Both sides been rapid fire, three to four seconds per move, and then thought for a minute, and then after five minutes, decided to play pawn to c6. Knight up, knight up here to e5, uh, and so if you look at it, uh, many people would see this, and they say, yeah, well, this is a normal move, knight to c3, but as you can tell from the situation we just looked at, now pawn takes on c4 doesn't look as intriguing for, for White's perspective. You can't bring the knight here to a3. Many times in the queen's game of decline lines, you still have your bishop here on f1. And so after you play pawn to e3, you still have that light square bishop to attack the square. You don't have that when you think head to the king side of the board. So White's not looking to bring his knight to c3 yet. Instead, we see knight up here to e5 trying to continue to be aggressive. Black continues with bishop to e6. And then we see the pawn capture, bishop recapture, and then knight up here to c3. Things are safe for the knight to get involved. This also does attack the bishop. Now, normally you wouldn't see the bishop take here. You would see the pawn capture so that the knight wouldn't come up here and force your bishop to move. Uh, but Peter Fiddler looks like hasn't been super comfortable in the positions. He's taking a few minutes every move. And so I think he saw this and just said, I'm going to go ahead and exchange material. Uh, if I can get down to more of a draw state, that's fine for me. So it decides to go ahead and exchange light square bishop off the board. King recaptures here on g2. And then knight to d7. Can't bring it here to c6, the natural square. So d7, also a great move. Attacks this knight here on e5. Also adds protection to this knight on f6. White plays queen to b3, and I thought we might actually see this earlier. Instead of the knight to e5 move, the main line would be queen to b3. This makes a ton of sense, but in the game, decided to play that knight to e5, and later on, only after knight to d7, do we see queen up here to b3. Just getting it more active involvement to the game allows the rook to come over to d1 and to support this pawn on d4. Trying to be aggressive with this queen, it attacks the pawn here on d 
B7. Uh, Black says, yeah, I I'm completely okay with exchanging material. Let's go ahead and exchange off queens. That should make things easier for me. So queen to B6. White's not ready to do that quite yet. First plays rook to D1. And then we do see an exchange. Now, white does have double pawns here on the B file. Not necessarily what he's looking for. Black definitely has a better pawn structure. What white does have going for him is control of the center of the board right now. So very, very aggressive uh, from Black's point of view. He doesn't have either of his rooks activated. Uh, White has one, the center of the board, ready to push forward. This rook here on a1 is threatening Black. Uh, this rook can't move. This pawn here on a7 would fall. Black would have to use another move, just play something like pawn to a6 to stop that attack, but very easy for White to get his other pieces involved into the game. So we'll see how this develops from here. The rook now swings to c8. Says, yeah, I'm seeing some stuff happen on the queen side. Not too worried about the the queen, the king side of the board. So I'm going to maneuver my rook to c8. Pawn up to f4. So what I like about this move is it continues the pressure. From White's perspective, he can't stay passive at all. Uh, and he can't just sit back and let his opponent just trade off pieces until the very end. Black would have a better end game, I think, with the better pawn structure, uh, especially here with the double pawns on the B file. I think Black could overwhelm him on the queen side of the board. So Vladimir correctly says, I need to continue to be aggressive. So let's go ahead and play pawn up to f4. Pawn to c5, trying to break up the center of the board. Bishop to e3 to protect that pawn. Uh, we do see an exchange in the rook takes. And I if you kind of look at it and say, can the bishop take? The bishop absolutely can. The reason for the rook taking here on d4, you'll see very quickly, after the knight takes on e5, the pawn recaptures, uh, forcing the knight to move. Knight's going to come back here to e8, and now rook to d7. Would not be possible if the bishop took here on uh, d4 and really wanted to control the seventh rank. Rooks do a fine job of attacking on open files, and against their opponent, really want to be on the seventh rank if you're white. And if you're black, you definitely want to be on this second rank back here. So from now, white's attacking a lot of squares. This pawn on e7, attacking this pawn here on b7. Still has to worry about this rook here on a1, as well as this bishop on e3, double attacking this square here on a7. So black is in a tough spot. Yes, the bishop here on g7 can take this pawn on e5, uh, but white's going to be able to easily get material back in. Uh, that's going to be completely fine. You know, he had the double pawns here. He wasn't expecting to hold on to both of these pawns anyway, uh, so that's going to be completely fine. Rook to c7 trying to trade off some material. Uh, we see rook up here to a7. What's nice is white can dictate how these exchanges go. There's not a good way for black to really counter that. Decides to play... A rook to b8 could have taken on a7 if he wanted to, but instead decides to play rook to uh, b8. Now rook down to d5, uh, protecting the bishop, says, hey, I I've got this pawn in material. Now I'm going to come down, protect this pawn, see if I can go up a pawn advantage here. A pawn to uh, b6 just says, yeah, I want to I want to exchange some material, uh, but keep in mind this pawn is now being attacked by this bishop. So it does open up a few more opportunities for for white to attack black's point of view i just think black is in a really really tough spot he has nothing aggressive going on he's just playing defense and he's just kind of waiting to see how white's going to attack him the knight comes up here to b5 very aggressive square it defends this rook here uh, attacking the rook here uh, we do see an exchange as you can imagine black's trying to exchange as much as possible the knight takes here on a7 King to f8, just preparing for the knight to c6, uh, and then taking here on e7. That'd be very difficult for black to deal with, since he doesn't have any other great move. Decides, let's go ahead and bring that king over here to f8 now. White continues to press his advantage, brings the rook back up here to d7, uh, and then rook to a8, attacking the knight, and then bishop to d4. And what's interesting is, in this position... Black resigned. Now, I get it. If you look at this, you could say Black's in a very tough spot. There's no way he could really come back for this. Uh, but I would like to think that Black could at least give it a good college try uh, and just see what he could come out of it. You know, worst could happen, he, 
he could lose. I mean, that's that's about as bad as he could get. But when you resign, same things. I'm not exactly sure why he resigned. If play were to continue, my guess is it would look something like this. There's a discovered attack uh, with Pawn to uh, to e6. You could have seen Pawn to f6 trying to blow up the attack here. Uh, nothing really looks good here. Pawn to e6. Uh, what's nice about this is it limits some of the squares the king can go to. Also adds protection for this rook on uh, d7. Maybe the knight tries to come out. It wasn't doing anything on the e8 square. Knight to c6. This is just deadly because now we have two attackers, the knight and the rook, on the e7 square. Maybe the knight comes down here to e7, trying to get involved, attack the opponent, but doesn't have enough material to really attack their opponent. This is all going to be bad. White can continue to gobble up pieces. Uh, very quickly, he can start attacking here on the king side of the board. While black could have found better moves uh, than these, I do think it would have fallen downhill very quickly. I still would have liked to see black continue just to see what he could have come up with. Uh, but at the end of the day, black decided to resign uh, just a few moves before, after bishop here to d4. So congratulations uh, to Vladimir. Uh, he played a great game, and at the end of the day, he's now a half a point behind the leaders. So Peter Sviller definitely falls after this. Three draws and a loss is not going to cut it so far. Uh, but all in all, great game. I just think White was way more prepared. Every single move, it seemed like, from Peter's side was three to five minutes, some of them even longer than that, eight to 10 minutes, uh, where normally pe people are prepared, uh, you know, half the moves are five to 10 seconds because they, they've gone through this in the lab with their team ready. Uh, and that's exactly what we saw from, from Vladimir. He had you know, 45 minutes left where uh, you see Peter there with just about 10 minutes or so. So at the end of the day, uh, congratulations to Vladimir. Great game. Hopefully you guys enjoyed round four. I will see you guys in the next video, round five.